commissione per la formazione e per la ricerca ci sono polemiche. Eh, L'Italia è un paese che usa malissimo i fondi per, per l'istruzione, questa è una cosa penso nota a tutti. Eh, negli altri paesi del mondo le cose vanno diversamente, eh, non a caso eh, tutti i paesi in cui si investe molto nell'istruzione sono paesi eh, che hanno un'economia forte, che hanno una crescita economica sostenuta, che hanno soprattutto dei posti, occupano dei posti importanti nella classifica della, diciamo, dei paesi che contano nel piano della tecnologia, della ricerca scientifica. Ecco, noi il professor Kruger oggi ci spiegherà, eh, su base dei suoi, dei suoi studi, eh, ci spiegherà i risultati della ricerca internazionale sul rendimento degli investimenti in istruzione, cercare di capire davvero quanto vale l'istruzione. Prego professor Kruger. Grazie Sergio. That's the last Italian I'll speak. Uh, I'd like to start by congratulating the city of Trento uh, for holding this festival. I can tell you uh, if we were to hold a festival like this in New Jersey, uh, we would get nearly so many people to attend, but, and especially on a rainy day like today. Uh, so I think it's a tribute to uh, what high esteem uh, people in this region uh, hold education in. Uh, what I'd like to do is talk about the economic value of education. And I'll draw on research that I've done and others have done. Um, and uh, also I'll advertise my book a little bit. I have a book which collects some of the articles I've written on education uh, called Education Matters. The um, uh, outline for my presentation is that I'll begin by presenting, summarizing the economic framework for education, due in large part to Gary Becker, viewing education as an investment. Uh, I'll talk about the payoff to that investment, the return to education. I'll talk about uh, evidence on uh, trends in educational attainment and student achievement. And then I'll talk about how school resources, uh, in my view, translate into student achievement. The themes that I'll emphasize in this lecture are first, there's no free lunch in education. And I put in parentheses usually. Uh, one exception may be higher education in Italy. Uh, I'll focus more on elementary and secondary education. And uh, often it's claimed that there's a magic bullet out there that will solve our educational problems. Uh, and my impression from uh, the available research uh, is that uh, uh, we could probably improve the performance of the education system, but I don't think we should expect extraordinary results, um, especially in a short period of time. One of the reasons why I say that is I think a very important factor in how much students and adults learn is how much time they devote to learning, time on task how much time they spend in school, the number of years of schooling that they have, the amount of time that they spend doing homework, the amount of time that they spend attending lectures, and so on. Um, and it's difficult to greatly increase the amount of time that children spend studying, uh, and it's also costly to do that. The third point I'll emphasize is that inputs do matter. Inputs like uh, the uh, number of students per teacher, the number of teachers that a school has, um, the quality of the teachers. <laughs> and I think the school inputs especially matter for disadvantaged children. Uh, then finally, I'll show you some evidence that the economy is demanding more highly skilled <coughs> workers. I suspect this will continue into the future, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I think the topic of this entire festival is of the greatest importance. So next, in this slide, I want to summarize the economic framework to thinking about education as an investment. And I have a quote here from Adam Smith from the Wealth of Nations in 1776, uh, which really does capture the idea of human capital. Gary Becker, of course, wrote a very important book in 1964, which extended and generalized the idea <coughs> of human capital with particular emphasis on education. Here's what Adam Smith wrote back in 1776. A man educated at the expense of much labor and time 
to any of those employments which require extraordinary dexterity and skill may be compared to one of those expensive machines. The work which he learns to perform, it must be expected, over and above the usual wages of common labor, will replace to him the whole expense of his education with at least the ordinary profits of an equally valuable capital. So Becker, uh, so excuse me, Adam Smith, as well as Becker, uh, had in mind the idea that when people think about investing in education, they think about how it will ride, how it will raise their income, and they can make judgments about investing time and resources into education versus other pursuits. And in equilibrium, we would expect that the payoff to investing in education, to obtaining more education, to learning more skills, had at least as much a return as a return to investing in machinery and equipment. Well, that's all fine at a theoretical level. Uh, the question that I'm most interested in is the evidence. What is the evidence on the rate of return, or in lay terms, the payoff to education? It's been known for a very long time, at least 100 years, that there's a strong correlation between people's income and the amount of education that they have. Now, correlation does not necessarily mean causality. And for a long time, economists have debated what this correlation means. And I'll show you a little bit of evidence uh, on this relationship. And by a correlation between income and education, what I mean is that people who tend to have more education also tend to have higher income. Well, perhaps the higher income is a result of getting that extra education. That's what Adam Smith would have predicted. Or perhaps it's picking up, reflecting other factors, what economists call omitted variables. For example, perhaps people who come from wealthier families tend to get more education because their families can afford the extra education. But perhaps they do well in the labor market, not as a result of that education, but because of their family's connections. Maybe they go into the family business, and that's why uh, they make higher income. So unless we can control, unless we can somehow adjust for the background factors, it's not clear whether the payoff to education that we observe is truly a result of the education per se, or merely reflecting some other features of individuals. Interestingly, a factor that cuts in the other direction is that when we interview people and we collect data from them, they sometimes misreport their education. Sometimes people will forget about a couple of years or will exaggerate. Um, and uh, if that's the case, if we have noisy data, then we might think that the correlation is actually obscuring the relationship between income and education. It's causing us to understate the strength of the relationship. And I'll uh, come back to that because I think in modern data sets, reporting errors, mistakes in the data actually play quite an important role. So let me show you a little bit of evidence on the relationship between earnings and years of schooling. Uh, this is from data from the United States. And this is a sample of around 30,000 men drawn from the current population survey. What this diagram shows you is for each number of years of education, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and so on, up to 21 years of schooling, those would be the PhD students, the average of the logarithm of the hourly wage for people with that level of education. Uh, so don't be intimidated by this. Just thinking of this as how average income tends to rise as you look across people with higher education. And you can see a very strong relationship here. Uh, between average earnings and average education. In economics, we like to take logarithms. There's a, uh, a theory behind why logarithms might make sense here for the logarithm of earnings. Uh, I think the stronger argument is that it tends to fit the data pretty well. And you can see this looks pretty much like a straight line. The points cluster pretty closely to the line. Uh, I have a friend who likes to say that we take logarithms because it makes us seem scientific. Uh, I think there's a stronger logic uh, than that. Uh, but also, if we do take logarithms, we can interpret the slope of this line as the proportionate increase in earnings associated with an additional year of education. 
And because the line fits the data so well, you can actually summarize the entire relationship between earnings and education with a simple number, just the slope of this line. And for the United States, the slope of this line is currently about 10%. Each additional year of education is associated with about 10% higher earnings. In the 1970s, that was more like 6%. So we've seen an increase in the payoff to education, which I'll come back to. And you've experienced a similar phenomenon here in Italy more recently. Uh, and you'll notice degrees do seem to matter. So completing secondary school, which is where it's a high school grad, well, that's a lot better than leaving high school in 12th grade. Or finishing a bachelor's degree or getting a JD seems to be a little bit above the line, but not tremendously above the line. So you're really not doing a, 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 a great injustice to the data by fitting a line through the points uh, to summarize the overall relationship. And if you were to look at the data in this way in other countries, I've done it for Germany, for Sweden, others have done it for Italy, the fit seems to be pretty close to a straight line. This is not unique to the United States. Now let me show you some more international evidence. This is from a study which looked at several European countries and tried to estimate that line, the slope of that line, for each of these countries. And you can see somehow in the translation to Italian, the green arrow got pushed a little bit to the left. Uh, but that's Italy to the right of the green arrow. So for men in Italy, uh, a year of education was associated with about 6.2% higher earnings in the mid-1990s. For women, which are shown in pink, a year of schooling is associated with a little bit higher increase in earnings, 7.7%. Uh, Those numbers are slightly below the average for all of Europe. But the Italian data are net of taxes. These are net wages, not gross wages. And most of the other countries are gross wages. If an adjustment is made for taxation, then Italy is very close to the average of all of Europe in terms of the relationship between earnings and higher education. Uh, so in that, in that sense, Italy looks like uh, the bulk of uh, Europe. Now you'll notice the UK looks a little bit of an outlier here, a higher payoff to education in the UK. In general, the countries that have more dispersion in their income distribution, like the United States and the UK, uh, tend to have a higher payoff to additional education. Countries like Sweden, the other Scandinavian countries, which have very compressed wages, less variability, uh, tend to have a lower payoff to an additional year of education. Uh, but one of the things I think this suggests is that across all of Europe, additional education is associated with higher earnings. It's still an outstanding question what that means. We know that people who get more education on average tend to earn more, but we don't know if it's because of that education. The key question, in my mind, is whether education and earnings uh, are uh, causally related. I don't know what you're handing. Is that a pointer? I'm not sure I need it. Thank you. Um, and a variety of strategies have been used in the literature to try to tease out the reasons behind the relationship between education and earnings, to try to probe whether the higher earnings associated with additional education is causal. And I would say it's a rarity in economics because almost universally, this literature says yes. As far as we can tell, this looks like a causal relationship. And I'd like to give you a flavor for the different types of strategies that have been used to address this question. The earliest studies tried to statistically control for factors like intelligence, as best we could measure it, for family background, and so on. Those studies tended to find that education was associated with higher earnings, maybe a little bit lower than what you would see if you didn't make that adjustment, uh, but there was still quite a strong relationship. Another line of approach use happenstance geography. If people happen to be, uh, happen to live near a school, they're actually more likely to go on to college or community college. Uh, just using this kind of uh, um, uh, geographic variability, uh, what those studies tended to find as well was that education was associated with higher earnings. Uh, I've done some work on twins 
compulsory schooling and comparisons across countries uh, that I want to go into in a little bit more detail. Uh, so the work on twins. Uh, it might be the last festival I went to was the Twinsburg Twins Festival in Twinsburg, Ohio. Now, I think this is a subtle difference between Italy and the United States, but in the United States we have festivals about twins. <laughs> and here you have festivals about economics. Uh, so uh, in any event, in the mid-1990s, four years in a row, I went to Twinsburg, Ohio with my colleague Worley Ashenfelter and a team of graduate students, uh, and we interviewed hundreds of identical twins. Uh, and I have to tell you, this was a unique experience. Uh, I personally interviewed identical quadruplets. And we had a clever idea in this, in, in, in this data collection because we asked each of the twins not only about himself or herself, but also about their twin. And this was important because we asked each twin, how much schooling do you have and how much does your sibling have? So for each person, we had two measures. And this is one way of overcoming the reporting errors. And they didn't always agree. In fact, we also asked them about their father, how much education does their father have? And since they had the same father, she would think they'd all report the same level of education. Uh, but the correlation was only 0.85, less than one. And identical twins tend to be very similar. So a lot of the differences in the education that you see are probably reporting errors. That's one of the things that we discovered. Um, actually, when I interviewed the uh, quadruplets, it was kind of a data set in, in a microcosm. Because we asked each one of the quadruplets about herself. There were four identical women in their early 30s. And then we asked about each of her siblings. So we needed four forms for each of them. And after I interviewed one, she went back to the group. I couldn't figure out which one I interviewed. Uh, the other thing that strikes me about this family uh, was that after uh, the, the parents uh, had two children, they then had quadruplets, and they had six children, they opened up a daycare center. And I suspect they were their own largest client. Anyway, let me show you some of the data. Uh, this is from a paper that Worley Ashenfelter and I published in the American Economic Review. And what we did was to line up the twins and take the difference between their education. And since we didn't know if the twin reported the correct education or the sibling reported the correct education, we took the average. That was a simple way of trying to overcome the reporting problems that arise. Uh, and what we found, as you can see here, is that there's a lot of noise around the line that we estimated, a lot of scatter around the line, but the twins, the, 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 the member of the pair of twins who had a higher level of schooling, on average tended to have higher earnings. And when we used a statistical technique to estimate the best fitting line through these points, what we found was that each additional year of schooling was associated with about 12% higher earnings. So even more than what I mentioned before, which was 10%. And identical twins represent a really good experiment here because they have the same genetic structure. They're not clones, but they are quite similar. Uh, they come from the same families. Uh, so there's no difference in family background which could possibly be uh, driving uh, the relationship that we see in the data. Um, so our study of twins and other studies of twins have also shown that earnings tend to rise uh, with education. Another thing that you'll notice here is there's a great deal of dispersion around the line. Now I will use my pointer. If you look at the point which says zero here, these are identical twins who have the exact same level of schooling. They don't all lie on the line. Uh, there was a big difference in earnings often between the pairs of twins. What that suggests is that there are factors beyond education which matter for individuals' earnings. Education is only one of many factors. Uh, some twins might have jobs which have uh, unpleasant working conditions and they get paid more as a result of that. Some might have been lucky and landed a job, a higher paying job. Uh, some connections might have helped in some cases and not in others. Um, uh, speaking about the role of luck, I heard a story recently that J.K. Rawlings, the author of Harry Potter books, uh, before she published the first book, she didn't have an agent. So she went to the library to look for an agent. She looked at several names, and she looked for a name which sounded like it might be a character in her novel. So she chose Christopher Little, who must be the luckiest man in the world. 
Uh, so clearly luck has some role to play uh, in, in, in the determination of earnings, uh, but education also matters. Uh, now, when we look at twins, we don't know why one twin has more schooling than the other one. Another line of work tries to use variability in education that comes from factors that we think are random, where we can explain why one group has more schooling than another. Uh, so I want to describe a little bit of this work uh, that I did with Joshua Angris, where we looked at the impact of compulsory schooling. And the logic behind this uh, is as follows. Uh, children start school depending upon whether their birthday is before or after the cutoff that year. And in the United States, in the period that we were looking, most children needed to turn a uh, six to start first grade by January 1st. If they were born December 31st, they just made the cutoff and they could start. If they were born January 2nd, they would have to wait an entire year before they began. Then when you combine that with compulsory schooling laws, we have something of a natural experiment. Compulsory schooling requires children to go to school typically until they reach their 16th birthday. Uh, I understand in Italy the compulsory schooling law just increased to 15 recently increased to 15. In the United States, it varies across states. It's either 16, 17, or 18. But in all cases, it's until you reach your birthday. So this sets up kind of an experiment where depending upon accident of date of birth, you're required to attend school longer if you were younger when you started. Now, I would say, unless you believe in astrology, I don't think date of birth has much to do with your inherent ability or the background characteristics, which I mentioned earlier, which might affect individuals' earnings irrespective of schooling. Um, so uh, this gives us something of a natural experiment. And I have to say, when Joshua Agris, who was at MIT, uh, and I first came up with this idea, I was really surprised to see that it worked pretty well in the data. So we use data from the US Census. And this looks at men who were born in the 1930s and the 1940s, and we've also looked at men in the 1950s. Very large samples. Over a million people are represented in this graph. And what we show you here is their average education. And steadily, education has been rising. But those who were born in the beginning of the year, January, February, March, the first quarter of the year, they tend to have a little bit lower education on average. See little blips down. And those who were born at the end of the year, October, November, December, they tend to get a little bit more education. And you can see this more clearly if we remove the trends from the data. If we deviate the ongoing trend, this shows you in the solid lines, the black uh, solid lines are the uh, deviations from the trend education level for those born in the first quarter of the year. Uh, and you can see they're typically negative. And in fact, when we look, in 29 out of 30 years, we found that those who were born in the first quarter of the year got a little less education than those who were born uh, at the end of the year. And as best we can tell, this looks like it's due to compulsory schooling. I think we could rule out a lot of other explanations. For one thing, this only arises for levels of education below, below high school. If you look at the chance of getting a college degree or getting a PhD, you do not see a seasonal pattern the way that we see it here. Um, and there's some other evidence which I think rules out uh, other possible uh, explanations. Uh, I remember Gary Becker once raised to me the possibility that people might have waited to the beginning of the new year so they could get a tax deduction, uh, which was a clever explanation, but I actually think it goes the wrong way since those tended to be the lower income ones. Uh, anyway, the next thing that we did was to look at their earnings. And I have to say, this really did shock me. When we use the census data to look at these individuals' earnings by date of birth, what you see here is year of birth, and we indicate the quarter of the year in which people were born. You see the little blips in education translate to blips in earnings. The same regular pattern arises. Uh, now, people tend to have higher earnings as they get older, which is why you see this overall pattern. But you see a large number of the blips down tend to be those in the first quarter. And again, I think we can rule out some other explanations. So if we look just at college graduates, we don't see this pattern at all. 
We don't see these uh, negative blips for the first quarter. And if you take the ratio of earnings for those born, say, uh, if, if you took the difference in earnings between those born in the fourth quarter of the year and the first quarter, and you compare that to the difference in their education, you could get a rough estimate of the value of an additional year of education, kind of a way of scaling these blips that we saw in earnings and education. Uh, and the best estimate we come up with is about 10% higher earnings associated with an additional year of schooling. And if you think about that, if our interpretation is correct, it's really a remarkable result because it says that the people who are compelled to go on to school longer than they want to, they're only in school because the law requires them to go to their 16th birthday. They benefit in terms of getting higher earnings later on from that extra schooling, which they otherwise would not have, have received. Now that schooling might have been very difficult for them, um, but it does seem to have a high payoff for them later on. And in fact, as best we can tell, it looks like those people benefit more from the extra schooling than the average person does from an additional year of schooling. Uh, and one of the conclusions I emphasized earlier, one of the themes I told you I would come back to, is that education seems to be more valuable for those who come from a more disadvantaged background. My interpretation of that pattern is that people from a more disadvantaged background have a much higher cost of attending school. Not only monetary cost of attending school, uh, monetary cost because there may be tuition when it comes to college, or there's uh, opportunity cost of their time, their family may need them to work, but also a higher psychological cost. I think students from a more disadvantaged background find school less interesting, they find it more difficult, and that's one of the reasons why they tend to complete less schooling. But because their costs are higher, um, it seems that if we push them further, or if we could figure out a way to keep them in school longer, they actually benefit from it even more than the typical person does. Oh, uh, I wanted to point out that this result also was anticipated by, by Adam Smith. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes from The Wealth of Nations. Uh, Adam Smith said, the difference between the most dissimilar characters, between a philosopher and a common street porter, for example, seems to arise not so much from nature as from habit, custom, and education. So Smith clearly thought that education had the potential to raise people's opportunities, uh, to raise their uh, living standards, um, and um, uh, change the types of professions they would qualify for, and so on. Uh, also, I suspect he was poking fun at himself, since Adam Smith was a philosopher, uh, so he chose to use his own profession there. Okay, now, uh, another active area of research has been to look not across individuals at education and look at how individual income relates to education, but to look across countries. And at the individual level, we tend to think of the um, uh, uh, relationships that we're estimating as giving us information on the private payoff to education. How much do you personally gain from getting additional education? The social return could be greater or less than the private return. The social return could be greater than the private return if people who are better educated uh, tend to have positive spillover effects for society as a whole. There's some benefit for society that they don't individually capture. Uh, we call those externalities. The social return could be less than the private return if all that education does is to signal who would have been a good worker anyway. In that case, education could become something of a rat race. And even though individually it might be a good decision for people to go on and get additional education, it might not be the case for society as a whole. Now, I tend to think that the results for compulsory schooling weigh against that interpretation. Because if all education did was signal individuals' ability, their credentials, if all education was was a credential of who has high ability, then extra education that was obtained because it was obligatory, because of compulsory schooling, would not convey very much information. Uh, but in general, it's proved difficult to distinguish between the private return to education and the social return to education uh, based on data on individuals alone. 
So one approach is to look across countries and say, the countries that have higher education tend to have higher, higher GDP per capita or higher income. Um, and the answer is certainly yes. Uh, this shows you uh, a graph where each point here is a country. And on the horizontal axis is average years of schooling, and the vertical axis is GDP per capita. Uh, and you can see that clearly the relationship is upward sloping, and it's a pretty strong correlation. Um, then a question arises, how does this relationship compare to what we find at the individual level? Suppose we started at the individual level and just aggregated up. Is the relationship between earnings and education at the individual level what we would predict we would find at the country level? And I think it's much harder to, to do analysis at the country level. There are so many things uh, that differ across countries, and we don't, as of yet, have enough data to look at the kinds of natural experiments that we've been able to use when we look at individuals, uh, like uh, date of birth and compulsory schooling. And there are no, or very few countries which are like twins, uh, where uh, we can control for very much by looking at the differences between them. Uh, so I think our knowledge base is much weaker when it comes to looking across countries, but I'll summarize what I found in, in work that I did uh, with Michael Lindahl, who's at Stockholm University. Uh, what we found is that there's a very strong correlation across countries at a point in time between earnings and education. And in fact, the slope of that line is a lot greater than what you find at the individual level. But if we look at changes when countries increase their education level, does their GDP per capita increase? And that's what this graph shows you. You get a much noisier relationship. And if you look over short time periods, five years, 10 years, you get a fairly weak relationship between the increase in education and the growth in GDP per capita. If you look over a 20 year period, you actually get a pretty strong relationship. Um, and the data we have at the country level, just like the data on the twins that we collected, are actually fairly noisy. Uh, not all countries do a good job collecting data on educational attainment. And when we look at changes, you tend to get a lot of changes which I think are just mistakes in the way the data are recorded or the way we estimate average education, uh, which is not what one would expect at the country level, because one of the advantages of using country level data is that you're averaging over a lot of different people. Uh, yet the data are still, I think, quite weak, and a lot of this work, I think, is more at its infancy uh, than the stage of the work uh, uh, on research at the individual level. Um, my sense is when we look at long periods of time, say over a 20-year period, increases in education in the country are associated with higher GDP per capita. And I would go one step further and say the increase is about what you would expect from the studies at the individual level. That each year of education is associated with about 10% higher earnings. Uh, now, uh, that conclusion is somewhat controversial, and it depends a little bit on what else one controls for in the model, uh, but I think it's hard to reject that conclusion. And what that conclusion suggests is that the payoff to education that we estimate at the individual level, the private payoff, is probably about the same order of magnitude as the social payoff. Because if there were benefits to education that go beyond the individual who got the education for society as a whole, that would show up when we look at the country level. That would generate a stronger relationship, a steeper relationship, a higher payoff to education at the country level than at the individual level. Um, but my sense is it's very hard to reject that the two are the same. Now there is a controversy in this literature because one body of research has found that what really matters, or what they've argued is what matters, is not so much the change in education, but the level of education that countries are starting from. Countries that have a higher level of education, people like Paul Romer and Ed Phelps have argued, tend to have faster growth. And they've gone on to develop theories that say things like, well, if you start from a high level of education, you can adapt new technology from abroad, and that has a, a benefit for society as a whole, which goes beyond the individual level. Uh, now, in the work I've done, I found that conclusion to be uh, pretty sensitive to the type of statistical model that one estimates. Uh, in particular, if you look at high-income countries, if you look at the OECD, for example, 
we don't find that the initial level of education matters for growth. Uh, that conclusion is being driven by the low-income countries. Moreover, you might argue that the payoff to education is different in different countries. That's something I showed you earlier. Maybe the payoff to the initial level of education is different in different countries. So if you allow the starting point to have a different effect in different countries, what you find is for the average country, the starting point doesn't matter very much. So my conclusion, which is somewhat tentative uh, and probably controversial, is that you do pretty well just starting with the micro data and aggregating from there. So that's the reason why I'm going to focus on trying to uh, draw inferences from what we find at the individual level. And at the individual level in both the United States, Italy, and much of the world, the payoff to education has been rising over time. This shows you a very simple illustration of that conclusion. This compares uh, average earnings for those who have a college degree or more to the average earnings of those who have exactly a high school degree. And in the 1950s, people with a college degree on average earned about 38% more than people with a high school degree. By 1970, it was about 60% more. That fell in the 1970s. My PhD advisor, Richard Friedman, actually wrote a book at the end of the 70s called The Overeducated American, based on that dip. The end of that book, it's little known, he actually predicted that it would rebound. I don't think he ever anticipated what happened in the 1980s. And you can see the payoff to education continued to grow in the 1990s. Uh, and in the 2000s, it's been pretty, pretty stable. Italy looks a little bit different, but it's certainly not the case that the payoff to education today in Italy is lower uh, than it was in the 1970s. This shows you for men, uh, based on a study by uh, Brunello, uh, Comey, and Sephora, the payoff to a year of education, based on those kinds of relationships that I showed you earlier, which all of the research suggests gives a reasonably good estimate of how education helps people in the labor market. Uh, it shows you separately for the private sector and the public sector. And you can see that since the early 1980s, in the public sector, the payoff to education has risen considerably in Italy. Uh, there's been growth in the private sector since the late 1980s, but not nearly as great. Uh, it's certainly not the case that the payoff to education has fallen over this time period in Italy. Uh, and uh, my interpretation of the evidence uh, is Italy started from a very low level in terms of the payoff of educa from education uh, and it's grown uh, to close to the OECD average um, since then. If you look at women, you see a much bigger jump in the, in the early 1990s uh, compared to what you see here, even though here you also see a pretty big jump. Uh, for men in the early 1990s. It's an interesting question why the public sector is so different from the private sector. Uh, and that's something uh, I'd be happy to discuss in questions, although uh, I think people in the audience probably know much more about that than I do. Uh, given that the payoff to education has increased, that the reward given to education is much greater now than it has been before, uh, one really has to worry about educational attainment. One has to focus on educational attainment. And I also think that gives some clues about uh, the forces, underlying forces in the labor market uh, that are uh, behind uh, the payoff to education. And I'll make that a little bit clearer in a moment, I hope. So this shows you data from the OECD. On average education for 25 to 64 year olds in various OECD countries, and you can see I point to Italy on the far right. Only Turkey, Mexico, and Portugal have a lower average level of completed schooling than Italy. So if you think about uh, uh, having an economy where the payoff to education is growing, and that's not only true in Italy, it's also true in the US, it's also true in the UK, uh, and in many other countries. Uh, Italy is starting from a pretty disadvantaged position. 
in terms of having a low level of average education uh, compared to the rest of the OECD. That's the bad news. The good news is that Italy's school enrollment has been growing very rapidly, much more rapidly than most countries in the OECD. And I guess if you go back to what I said earlier, what's more important, I believe, is the change in education than the initial starting point. Uh, that's good news for Italy. Uh, this shows you school enrollment. Secondary school on the left, tertiary school on the right. And you can see a very sharp trend here. Uh, school enrollment has been growing very rapidly since the 1950s in Italy. And only Greece, Ireland, Korea, and Spain have seen faster growth in education than Italy. Okay, so let me try to put this picture together. Uh, we have an increase in the supply of educated workers in Italy, which is a quite rapid increase compared to the rest of the world. And at the same time, the payoff to a year of education looks like it's either rising or staying the same, probably rising slightly in recent years. What does that suggest in terms of supply and demand? Well, the increase in school enrollment means that a higher share of the workforce is better educated. The supply of higher educated workers has increased. And this diagram shows you uh, a supply curve in red and a demand curve in blue. And I have on the axes the relative employment of highly educated workers and the relative wage of highly educated workers. So the supply of highly educated workers has shifted out because of the increase in school enrollment. Other things equal, we would expect that to lower the payoff to education. But in fact, the payoff to education has not fallen in Italy. It's actually risen. That suggests that the demand curve has increased more rapidly than the supply curve. And Italy looks very much like the United States in this regard. In the US, we've also had an increase in the supply of educated workers. But that increase was not fast enough to keep pace with the increase in demand, in my view. And that is uh, an important factor driving the increase in the payoff to education uh, in the United States. Uh, and it seems to be the case in Italy as well. So understanding what's going on to the demand for skilled workers. Why is it increasing is very important. Uh, you can fill up a whole festival with talks on the role of technology, globalization, and the demand for skilled workers. Uh, I won't go into this in very much detail, but I do believe that changes in technology at work are a driving force behind this increase in demand for highly skilled workers. Uh, but I also want to emphasize that the job mix is hard to predict. Uh, and I'll do this by telling you the story about the movie The Graduate. Uh, I assume that many of you have seen The Graduate. And you'll remember that Benjamin was advised to go into plastics. I think about 1968. So I checked before I came here, and job growth in plastics is a little bit below average. So uh, he should have been advised to go into, um, uh, uh, especially since he was in California, into the high-tech industry instead of plastics. Uh, I'll give you an illustration of how hard it is to predict the job mix. Uh, I did a little experiment where I, I took the set of occupations that we had in 1960. The Census Bureau in the United States has a set of codes where they code all of the major occupations, very detailed. And then I said, how much of the job growth between 1960 and 2000 was due to occupations that were not part of the 1960 occupation codes? Occupations that were not deemed important enough to actually have their own code. Maybe they didn't even exist at that time. More than half of the job growth was in occupations that were new occupations that did not exist in 1960. So it would have been really impossible based on the 1960 job codes, the set of occupations that we were using to predict where the job growth would come from. Because by and large, they were very small occupations which were not so important to merit their own code or brand new occupations which we didn't conceive of at the time. So the job mix is continually changing. One of the great strengths of the US labor market is it's, it, it's flexible enough to accommodate a new set of jobs. And also, I would argue, the education system is flexible enough to prepare workers for those jobs. Uh, but we can see one steady trend in the job mix, which is, uh, this is from a, a study that was done by David Otter, Frank Levy, and Richard Renane. 
if you break down jobs and say, what types of skills do they use? Do they use cognitive skills? Uh, do they use routine manual skills like um, um, uh, digging a ditch or working on an assembly line? Uh, what has increased are non-routine analytic skills, non-routine interactive skills, and what's gone down are routine cognitive skills, the types of uh, cognitive skills that can be replaced easily by a computer, uh, and manual, routine manual skills. Uh, that suggests that we need to prepare workers, assuming that these trends continue, uh, we need to prepare workers for an environment where they're continually adapting, where they're learning to do new things on the job. Uh, they're not always doing the same thing from day to day. Um, also, I think given the um, uh, changes in the world economy, the fact that uh, um, so many countries are now uh, competing in, in a global environment, uh, and the ability of the internet to have people deliver some of their output from really remote locations, we need to focus more on interactive skills, interpersonal skills, uh, what my colleague Alan Blinder calls personally delivered services. Okay. Let me next move uh, to alternatives to just years of education. Uh, I will make a segue here by pointing out Marion Jones, the great sprinter, did a campaign for Nike uh, which had the tagline, education, the more the better. It dawned on me there's a limit to that uh, statement uh, because of course there's a cost to additional education. So I think a question that we should address is how can we improve what we get for the education that we're currently getting? How can we get more out of the current level of education? Um, and here I want to talk about evidence on test scores. Uh, historically, it was the case that, educate, that, that, that um, students' cognitive ability as measured by tests seemed to work mainly through the amount of education that they got. The schooling, that, that scoring better on standardized tests predicted whether people would get more schooling, but it was the schooling that mattered, not their test achievement. Now the test scores seem to have more of an independent effect. And some research suggests that raising test scores from an initial level will also be associated with higher earnings. There's a pretty strong relationship between average earnings and individuals' test scores. Uh, this shows you for the US for the National Adult uh, Literacy Survey. Their, uh, their, their reading test scores measured in lexiles on the x-axis and then average earnings, and you can see a pretty tight, pretty steep relationship here. Um, so how can uh, we raise test scores and uh, clearly understanding where countries stand in terms of their test scores is important. Uh, Italy, like the US, stands near the bottom. Uh, this is from the PISA 8th grade math tests in 2003. And you can see Italy is here. The countries are ranked in terms of their average performance. The United States is just two countries ahead. Russia is in between. Not very distinguished uh, in terms of the overall world picture. A couple of other facts from PISA, which are of some relevance. Uh, first, um, family background matters quite a bit in test performance, especially in Italy. If you rank families uh, based on their income, occupational status, and so on, those who are in the bottom quarter in terms of socioeconomic status are three times more likely to be among the lowest quarter of performers on the PISA standardized math test than family, the children from families in the top quarter in terms of socioeconomic status. So coming from a more advantaged background, very strongly associated with test performance in Italy. Uh, that's true in the US as well. It's true all around the world, but it's particularly true in Italy and the US. Then secondly, with the data from PISA, we could look, try to make a decomposition and say what part of the variability in the student test scores is from schooling, is from the particular school they go to, and what part is due to other factors. The component that's due to the school that students are attending in Italy tends to be quite big. A lot of the differences of performance in Italy are coming about, um, or at least are associated with, the particular school that students are attending. Now PISA just gives a snapshot, just shows you at a point in time how uh, uh, students are performing. 
that's very important, but it's also important to have some historical information, to have a trend. And I wanted to share with you some evidence that I've assembled to try to look at longer term time trends. This is from the International Adult Literacy Survey. Adults are given literacy tests in quantitative reading, prose reading, and document reading. Three different measures of literacy. And what I did was to group people based on their birth cohort, to try to convert these data into historical data. Now, if people leave school and don't get any smarter or dumber, this is a perfect approach. You might worry that maybe uh, when people get older, they, they don't read as well, they don't read as quickly. There's not all that much evidence on that, but that is a potential concern with these data. But it's gonna be less of a concern because I'm gonna make comparisons across countries, and you might think that the extent to which people become uh, more literate or less literate as they age is pretty constant across countries. So what do you see here for Italy? Well, first of all, for all three of these measures of literacy, you see an upward trend. That means the more recent cohorts are much better readers than the earlier cohorts. Uh, also, the trends are about the same, and uh, I think it's a bit overkill to look separately at the qual at the uh, quantitative literacy, prose literacy, document literacy, because they all tell about the same story. Uh, and to a certain extent, you might say it's a good news story for Italy. This looks like progress. Each successive cohort is scoring higher. This is the United States. Uh, now, I've scaled these the same way. And the United States, I'll go backwards. The United States started out at this uh, a considerably higher level than Italy. Uh, but then the United States plateaued. And the more recent cohorts you can see are actually doing worse, a little bit worse than the earlier cohorts in the United States. And by the cohorts born in the 1970s, performance on the adult literacy survey in Italy and the United States is about the same, uh, which is interesting because that's what the PISA is showing. The PISA data are showing as well. Now let me group some other countries for you. The top line is Sweden. Sweden starts out at a higher level of literacy and continues to grow. The next line is the UK. That's the red line. Uh, and the UK had very steep increase, which is associated with the period when they increased the compulsory schooling age. Uh, and then you can see the UK is kind of plateaued. And then below that you have Ireland and then Italy. And essentially all of the countries are converging, except for Sweden, at the same level. So the last topic I want to address is how to try to array, uh, how to try to affect the achievement levels, and in particular uh, the amount of money that's being spent on schools, the effect of school resources on student achievement. Uh, now, one economist, Eric Hanischek, has argued very strongly that spending money on schools does not produce output, does not increase student achievement. This is a quote from an influential study that. Uh, Professor Hanischek did. He said that close to 400 studies of student achievement demonstrate that there is not a strong or consistent relationship between student performance and school resources, at least after variations of family inputs are taken into account. And that conclusion is very widely cited. And I'm going to argue I don't think it's persuasive. I don't think it's persuasive based on the evidence that Professor Hanischek produced, and I don't think it's persuasive based on the best evidence that's available. Uh, now, I do think that this is a legitimate concern for Italy, because if you look at the data from PISA, this shows you student achievement in eighth grade graphed against expenditures on students up into eighth grade, so cumulative expenditures while students are in primary school for each of the countries. And Italy is an outlier, actually a slightly larger outlier than the US. Here is Italy in the bottom right corner, and the United States slightly above. But both Italy and the United States are below the line. Now the fact that the line is upward sloping suggests that as we look across countries, those who spend more money on students through eighth grade do on average tend to have higher achievement scores on PISA. Now, of course, there may be many other explanations uh, other than the effect of the expenditures, uh, but I do suspect that the expenditures are playing a role here. Uh, and then you have the United States and Italy as outliers below the line. 
Now, one of the reasons, probably the main reason Italy spends so much on its schooling compared to other countries is that Italy tends to have small classes. The most important determinant of how much is spent per student is the number of teachers who are hired. That's the main input in schooling. Oh. Uh, and you can see Italy tends to have fairly small classes compared to the rest of the OECD. And it's expensive to have small classes because you have to hire additional teachers. So the last topic I'm going to talk about is the effect of class size on student achievement, since I think that's quite important for Italy. Now the evidence that Professor Hanischek had in mind was based on a summary of the literature that he did. Recall, in that quotation I read, uh, he said there were close to 400 studies, or over 400 studies, uh, which found no strong or consistent relationship. Uh, for 277 studies, Professor Hanischek looked at the effect of class size on student achievement. And you can see that they're just as likely to have to show a positive effect of smaller classes as they are to show a negative effect of smaller classes. And about 20% of the studies, they didn't even report whether it was positive or negative, which I've always considered a mystery. Um, and when you look at that, it seems that, well, maybe there's a lot of support for this claim that having smaller classes does not help on average. But there's something very curious in, in these data. Uh, first, there really were not 277 separate studies, or 400 separate studies. There were only 59 studies. And what was done was to take multiple estimates from some studies. So from two studies done by the same authors, Professor Hanischek took 48 estimates. From my own study in the journal Political Economy, he took one. And if you look at the results, based on the number of estimates that he took from each of the studies, what you find is from the studies where he took one estimate, overwhelmingly you find that smaller classes are associated with positive effects. If you look at the studies where he took two or seven estimates, overwhelmingly smaller classes were associated with uh, better results. And if you look at the studies where he took eight or more estimates, which is just nine studies, a small minority of the overall literature, there overwhelmingly you find that smaller classes are associated with worse student achievement. Uh, so you have to wonder about these nine studies. And I can tell you, I've reviewed these nine studies, they're not pretty. Uh, many of those studies were not focused on the effect of class size. Many of them did what I would call a kitchen sink approach. They were interested in the effect of some other factor, family income in some cases. The students from more advantaged families have higher achievement. And they just threw in all the variables they could think of. Often the specifications that they estimated made no sense. It was very common for them in their statistical analysis to hold constant the effect of class size as well as the effect of expenditures per student. Well, if you do that, what you're doing is comparing two schools which have the same expenditures per student but different class size. How can they achieve that? They could achieve that by paying the teachers less. So the effect of class size in that kind of a model is actually estimating the effect of having lower teacher pay rather than the effect of expenditures per student. But reasoning is like, rate, is like racing and not like hauling. And the single barber is steed can outrun 100 dray horses. And I think when it comes to empirical evidence, it's often the case that the questions we're addressing are very difficult. We might try to control for factors that we can't control for adequately, and as a result, the evidence is not very persuasive. Ideally, what we would like to have is an experiment, an experiment where we would randomly reduce class size for some students and not for others. And that's been done. It was done in Tennessee, in the United States, in the late 1980s. 11,600 school children from 79 different schools were randomly assigned when they started kindergarten. They were assigned to either a small class with 12 to 15 students, a regular sized class with 22 to 25 students, or a regular sized class with a teacher aide. And they were to stay in those classes for four years the teachers were also randomly assigned. Uh, and I've been evaluating 
the performance of these students since the experiment began. What do you see? Well, in green is the average percentile rank on the Stanford Achievement Test, one of the standard tests we have of student achievement in the United States. For the, in green, the students in the small classes. In blue, the students in the larger classes. And then in the light blue, the powder blue, students who were in the larger classes with the teacher aid. And you can see that the performance was about five or six percentile points higher on average for the students who were in the smaller classes. Now, that didn't increase the longer they were in the smaller classes. It stayed at about five or six percentile points. Um, but it might be the case that if everyone moved to regular size classes, it would have fallen or maybe even disappeared. Uh, I've looked at some longer term outcomes for these students. Uh, high school graduation was higher for the students from the smaller classes. Their ACT and SAT scores were higher, especially for the minority students from the smaller classes. Those are the tests that students take if they uh, would like to apply to college. Uh, teen parenting was lower, uh, and uh, the crime rate was lower, uh, especially for black males if they were in the smaller classes. Uh, and college aspirations, the chance of taking one of the college tests was higher. Uh, you can see here's a press briefing where I had a very good assistant. The assistance here has been excellent. Um, and I, I expect that the assistant I was assigned here will do as well as Mr. Clinton. Uh, anyway, um, having been assigned to a small class does seem to have lasting effects. Let me skip over that slide to, to wrap up. When you look at the data more closely, it looks like being in a smaller class had an especially beneficial effect for the more disadvantaged students, for the students who were below the poverty line, for the students who were minorities, uh, for the students who lived in the inner cities. It also had a bigger benefit for boys than it did for girls. I interpreted this result as suggesting that it helped to socialize students, especially in their early grades. Now, I don't think having small classes matters as much at the college level or the high school level as it does at the early level, at the, at the early grades. Uh, but at the early grades, I think it helps the teacher to maintain control in the classroom if he or she has a smaller class and the students learn to be, to be better students. If you try to do a benefit-cost comparison, uh, looking at the gain in test scores, how much is that worth later on, what I concluded is that the benefits were about twice as much as the costs. Or another way of saying that is if you use an interest rate, a discount rate of 6%, in that case, the benefits would be about equal to the costs. So it's not an extraordinary large return. I said earlier there's no free lunch. It's about the return. I think you would, you would say that seems reasonable. That's close to the return to capital. Um, uh, for the more disadvantaged students, the return is higher. Uh, overall, 6% uh, seems like a reasonable rate of return. So, uh, let me make a few comments about implications of all of this for Italy, and then I'd like to take some questions. Uh, first, in Italy, educational attainment, years of schooling, as well as achievement are growing. And they're both growing pretty rapidly. And I think it's important to continue that trend. Um, I think it's difficult uh, to raise achievement beyond the levels where Italy is currently. I think that's going to be a real challenge, um, because class sizes are already small in Italy. Uh, but I think maybe focusing at the disadvantaged students, focusing more in the underachieving schools, because uh, they seem to do particularly poorly in Italy, uh, would be one strategy for improving the overall average for Italy. Um, and I suspect it's going to be the case that in the future, the demand for highly skilled workers is going to continue to grow, and probably continue to outstrip the increase in supply in Italy, uh, uh, which makes investing in education all the more important. Why don't I stop there and take some questions? Ringraziamo il professor Kruger che ci ha offerto delle ottime argomentazioni a noi per investire nell'istruzione dei nostri figli e probabilmente al governo per rendere più efficiente la spesa nell'istruzione. Ora, se volete porre qualche domanda, qui c'è il microfono. 
very, very good talk, very interesting talk, pulled together a lot of your stuff and some others. I have a couple of questions. I think the rate of return estimates you get are, are right. I mean, 10, 12 percent, I'm not sure exactly, but that seems like the right ballpark. But increasingly, I think we've become aware that the, return, the earnings return is only a part of the total return. And there's something we call the education premium paradox in, in sort of in analogy with the edu equity premium paradox. That almost every variable that I think has been looked at, education helps. If you look at health, I think there we have very good evidence that more educated people are healthy. And it's not just reverse causation, although there's some of that. Look at marital stability, investment in children, uh, voting, you name it. It's hard to find anything where education isn't positive. So it's hard, it's difficult to add all that up, but it's going to mean that the, the total return on education is far, I think, in excess of 10%, maybe 15%, I don't know what the number is. I say, well, how can we have an equilibrium where we're getting these high rates of return on education and we aren't getting more and more people going. Now, you said, well, people don't like school. I know they don't like school, but they have to not like school a, a tremendous amount in order to explain this. Uh, well, they may be capital constrained, but it's very hard in terms of what we know now for, for at least for the advanced countries to explain it by capital constraints. And so I think it's a real paradox. I don't, I don't have the answer to that. I've, I've worried about it a lot, and I wondered if, if, what your solution is, but I think you got to be careful of just saying, well, people don't like school. I mean, that's, that's like bringing in some residual and saying, well, I, I close up the system by this variable, which I can't measure, and, and I don't know what its magnitude is. So I'd like to hear your response to that. Thank you very much, Gary. I think the first part of your question, which is, I had in my notes to discuss a little bit on crime and education and, and health and so on, which I'm glad you mentioned because I neglected to, to mention that, is actually not necessary for the second part. Because in the second part, all you have to do is point to the monetary return increasing from 6% to 10 or 12% and say, why haven't we been, why hasn't, haven't the schools been flooding with more students in the U.S.? No, but it's, the, but it's the increase that should affect, I mean, if we were initially in an equilibrium, it's the increase that should cause the enrollment to increase, I think. It, it could well be we were not in an equilibrium initially, and well, then we have a bigger puzzle. But let, let me, on, on the first part, I think in order for your point to be right that it's higher, it would have to be that it raises those other things by more than 10%. I mean, suppose suppose I think of the monetary returns, just giving me a rule. Well, I see you shaking your head, so I'll say this with, with some caution. Um, I had often thought about the role of education in home production, you know, a topic which you've thought about very deeply. And I can't tell you what it was specifically about my education, especially K-12, which is beneficial to me on the job. And I suspect that those same kinds of things are beneficial to me in home production, in interacting with, with, with my family, in interacting when I go shopping and making decisions. Uh, so that's a part of the return, which is a much bigger part in terms of my, my, my hour probably than my work life, uh, which is not getting counted. And I would even think 10%, there's no reason to think it's not the same as, as what's going on at work. With work. Um, but anyway, I do agree with you that education has these benefits in addition to the narrow economic measure uh, that I've been looking at. When I did the benefit cost study for the STAR experiment, if you added in all the results for crime, if you added in the benefit from crime, and the benefit from reduced teen pregnancy in some ways, it was very small. But the biggest part there, at least when it came to, to, to school resources, was from higher achievement and higher earnings. Um, so to your main question, which is, why haven't we seen more of an increase in the moment? We have seen some in the US. The group that hasn't increased is African Americans. African Americans in the US have had pretty stable educational attainment despite uh, what seems to be very high increasing returns, high and increasing returns uh, for the next year education. Uh, and I'm not sure of the answer to that because I uh, take a little bit of exception when I, when you say that saying that students don't find school interesting is a residual. There's actually some evidence on that. 
Uh, Danny Kahneman and I have been collecting data on how people feel about the activities they do throughout the day. And what was remarkable to me is people do not find school interesting. And in fact, with the, with the young men, they find it painful. One of the, one, one, one of the emotions we asked them about was how much pain did they experience? And especially when they were doing homework, uh, they were reporting high levels of pain. But even if- That's not how much pain Right, right. Yeah, I, I, I don't have a very good answer. Um, I think part of it does have to do with capital constraints, liquidity constraints, but I'm not gonna lean too far on that. I was actually quite cautious about saying liquidity constraints were, were all that important in the debate I had with Jim Heckman. Um, so my, my, my tentative answer is that uh, we should think about ways of reaching the children who are at high risk of dropping out. Because it's difficult to find alternatives to help them get on track if they do drop out. Um, and I think trying to make school more interesting for them, of more value, where they can see what that value is, would be helpful. Um, I do think that school enrollment has increased in the U.S. because of the increase in, uh, in, in the payoff education, but not as much as I would have expected or as you did. I have a question for you. Uh, looking at the recommendation for Italy regarding education, maybe you kind of, you were mentioning one, one kind of return of education is the wage return that you can get. But we know that, as you mentioned, there are exter externalities that are not captured by the wage dimension, and in particular, growth externalities. So uh, the effect of education on growth will be much bigger than what you know, the effect would be on, on earnings. Now, in Italy, maybe, and you mentioned some work, you know, relating growth to levels of education, and when you restrict it to OECD data, you didn't find so significant. But maybe one, one way to get significance is to distinguish between different types of education, uh, like lower education and higher education, and to interact the composition of education with how developed the country is. So, for example, for Italy and France, what is striking is that at the, at the stage of development they are investing more in higher education, would be, uh, would be very much growth enhancing, particularly if you combine the investment in higher education with autonomy, with move to, towards autonomy of universities. So I was wondering what you think about, you know, isn't that the kind of first order thing that Italy could do, uh, you know, to, on, on the education side to, to improve its growth performance? I, I certainly agree, but not because of I presented today that having more autonomy in higher education in Italy makes a lot of sense, uh, or at least in some subset of schools. But um, I tried pretty hard in this work I did with Michael Lindahl to look at higher, you know, tertiary education versus secondary education at the initial level, changes across the OECD, and you can often get mush. You know, when, when, when you try to include the levels in, in, in at the same time, or in Barrow's work, he separated out by sex and found completely bizarre results that uh, women's education didn't seem to matter, uh, which I found to be a result not, which is not very robust. Um, I do think that for Italy, you know, if you look at the individual, well, by the way, I would say the evidence on the internalities, to my mind, I think they're small. I mean, I, I think it's more a presumption um, for, for OECD countries. But I would say based on the evidence that um, if, if you want to look across different groups and so on, Investing in education for women in Italy makes a fair amount of sense. The payoff to education is higher in Italy. Uh, they've also, women have had faster growth since school enrollment, I believe. Um, and uh, it, it may be that they're gonna enter into more flexible sectors uh, of employment. Um, I do tend to think that, um, you know, if there are gonna be externalities, it will probably be from higher education, which will help to adapt to new technology. Um, but so far, I've been skeptical that, uh, that they're there. And I tend to prefer parsimony. So in my mind, you know, if you can explain the data pretty well without having to turn to spillovers, then I, then I tend to prefer that. So, so maybe I'm just kind of stubborn about that. But if, I, if, if that's where I start with an old hypothesis, I haven't seen enough evidence to move from that. Io sono un insegnante italiano e temo che, parlo per me ovviamente, temo che noi insegnanti italiani non siamo molto abituati a questo tipo di statistiche, di correlazioni fra la scuola, 
i vantaggi economici, il risultato complessivo sulla produttività. Mia moglie che è insegnante come me di fatti ha detto io vado a sentire un grado Galimberti. Tuttavia dopo la sua relazione ritengo che queste questioni siano importanti. Però mi domando, collegandomi a qualche domanda precedente, la modalità per motivare i giovani allo studio, la modalità principale può essere quella guadagnerai di più. E anche nei confronti dello Stato motivare a investire di più. Non c'è il rischio che privilegiare questo approccio, gli anni di studio comunque sono importanti, si finisca con il privilegiare una testa grossa piuttosto che una testa ben fatta. La ringrazio. Let, let me first say that you have my sympathy because my wife is also a school teacher. And, and I know that means many nights when she's grading papers and writing tests. Um, the question about how can we motivate young people to do better in school and stay in school longer, which is very much like the question Gary Becker asked. Um, one thing I would think about, uh, I, I, I think, you know, as an economist, I think trying to explain to people what the return to education means, what it try to relate it to them in their own lives uh, and how there's a value can matter, uh, but I don't think that's going to matter for all students, of course. There is a lot of research that suggests that more disadvantaged students learn better in terms of contextual learning. And when I worked at the Labor Department in the United States, I had done some work trying to reform our job training programs. And the direction we were trying to move in was to show a context for why the students were learning geometry, why if you're a carpenter, you actually could benefit from geometry. That will help to make you a better carpenter. And so that they can see the context connected with the substantive material. Uh, and I think that is one way to try to make schooling more interesting to students. Uh, I can also tell you, I think it's difficult. I've been writing for the last four years a textbook to try to teach high school students economics. And it's a lot harder than it looks. And, and try to write the language that the students can, can, can uh, access and to use examples that the students can relate to is, it is difficult. So I have a great deal of sympathy for the teachers who do this uh, because I, I think it's much harder than it seems. Uh, the other thing I would add is one trend, which I don't know how well appreciated this is in Italy, since education of the parents' generation has been growing so quickly in Italy, that should have some beneficial effects. I believe that education does help to make people better parents. It will help to improve their, their, their children's performance in school. Uh, and I think that's something which you can, uh, uh, and, and I think you might expect to see improvements coming into PISA over time, uh, just because of improvement in uh, the education background of parents. Sempre a proposito dell'Italia, non per essere provincialisti, ma visto che siamo qui parliamone, è uscita all'inizio di questa settimana un'inchiesta italiana proprio sulla correlazione tra eh, i salari dei laureati e i salari dei diplomati, e proprio in coincidenza con questo convegno e tristemente è emerso che mentre in termini reali c'è una tenuta o un aumento dei salari dei diplomati, i laureati invece tristemente vedono decrescere il loro salario. Addirittura molti laureati dichiarano che al colloquio per il lavoro non dicono di essere laureati. Allora qui volevo chiedere se non ci sono fattori anche legati uno alla dimensionalità delle imprese e alla struttura dell'economia che possono a volte essere, come per esempio in Italia, molto importanti tante piccole imprese forse non hanno bisogno di così tanti laureati. Secondo aspetto, lei, diceva, lei parlava anche del tipo di lavoro che si andrà a fare e parlava di lavori, nuovi lavori, 
legati alla tecnologia, allo sviluppo tecnologico. E allora bisogna anche chiedersi alti livelli di istruzione ma in quali ambiti? Sfortunatamente in Italia le nostre facoltà scientifiche e tecnologiche sono deserte. Forse abbiamo troppi avvocati, troppi laureati in lettere, adesso sto un po' provocando, ma pochi fisici, genetisti e così via. Quindi è possibile anche effettuare magari degli studi considerando simultaneamente più fattori, quindi sul, sulla correlazione tra salario e istruzione. Non solo l'istruzione ma anche la struttura dell'economia, ma anche, forse sempre più determinante, il tipo di istruzione. Grazie. I'm not familiar with the study that you referred to, so I don't know over which time period it's, it's referring. I can tell you as a regular pattern, those with higher level of education have much lower unemployment rates. And that is true in Italy, the, the, the data that I looked at most recently, as, as well as elsewhere. Um, predicting which sectors of the economy are going to grow, I think is very difficult. I mean, I think the general pattern, this gets me back to plastics. Um, and uh, I don't want to sound like the character which advised to go into plastics. One of the advantages of education is I think it makes uh, it possible for people to make transitions. And I do think that the changes in the global economy are going to lead to, you know, we, clearly we've seen as countries grow, they make a transition from agriculture uh, to manufacturing, to manufacturing to services, and some of the factors that you mentioned about Italy, I think, make the transition to services more difficult. Uh, some of the regulation in Italy uh, uh, makes that more difficult. It's also one of the things which makes Italy so distinctive, which an interesting place to visit. Um, and I, I, I suspect that that will continue at a broad level. I suspect that the type of services that will grow will be more personally delivered services. Um, because uh, uh, types of, uh, One of the things which we're just at the beginning of, I suspect, of seeing offshoring of services. Um, but there's no reason why that shouldn't grow. Certainly companies have a very strong incentive to develop the technology so that they can offshore the provision of telephone centers, for example, um, uh, to low-wage countries, uh, which have a high supply of, of uh, skilled workers, uh, especially countries that speak the same language. Uh, I think that's probably more of a risk for the US than Italy. But if that's the case, then I think what you'll see is uh, um, more of the domestic employment going, more of domestic employment going into industries where the service is delivered personally. Um, and where social interactions matter more. One of the reasons why I think education does command such a high premium in the labor market is that people who have a higher level of education are able to adapt to changes in the economy. They can switch to different sectors when those different sectors tend to grow. Uh, so I would say as kind of an insurance policy, you might think <coughs> of higher education as a way of insuring against fluctuations, which are, are, are I would argue, very difficult to predict. Mi ho sempre pensato che eh, le classi piccole, gli alunni, classi poco numerose, siano le più efficienti dal punto di vista del lavoro degli insegnanti, per tutte le cose che portano in mente. Lei questo, questa sera ha rinforzato questa diffusa opinione per tutti gli insegnanti. Nello stesso tempo però recentemente eh, per lavoro stavo analizzando i dati della ricerca internazionale IER Teams, IEA, Friend Incarnation, eccetera, eccetera, dove però si notava come eh, il rendimento medio in matematica e in scienze degli alunni migliorava via via che la numerosità della classe aumentava. Arrivavamo addirittura un esempio della Corea che ha più di, mediamente più di 40 alunni per classe, eh, dove i suoi risultati sono eccezionali per molti aspetti, ma non solo per questo. Questo trend è, cioè, interessava praticamente quasi tutti i paesi che partecipavano all'indagine, sono Eh, sono un po' sì, avrei bisogno di qualche riporto ulteriore grazie
any student achievement on the science and math uh, exams to uh, uh, school resources and class size. Uh, I think you have to be careful when you use data collected like the TIMS, which uses the class sizes that the school administers, administrators happen to assign students to. Uh, there's a very nice theoretical paper by Ed Lazier in the Quarterly Journal of Economics uh, on the uh, production, school production, and how schools should optimally choose to assign students to classes. The model he has in mind is kind of similar to what I concluded about socialization, but he's much more um, analytic about it. And the model he has in mind is that if you have a big class, you're more likely to have disruptions. And suppose that um, uh, there's some chance that a student is going to disrupt the class, well, that slows down everybody in the class. If you have a bigger class, then you're just going to get more disruptions. So in Lazier's model, the advantage of reducing class size is that it reduces the number of disruptions. Now, if you have students who are prone to disrupt the class and students who are very well behaved and not prone to disrupt the class, the optimal assignment for the school administrator is to group the students who are well behaved and will not disrupt the class in very big classes and put the other ones in smaller classes. And to some extent, I think school administrators have this in mind. If you look at special needs classes, they tend to be very small. And in a country like Korea, where um, uh, students uh, do seem to be better disciplined uh, than, say, in uh, elementary schools in the United States, uh, then I think they can get by with larger classes. So you have to bear in mind the way that the school administrator is choosing to assign the resources that he or she has and the optimal assignment is probably to put the weaker students in the smaller classes uh, where they would get more individualized attention and they would disrupt fewer of their classmates because the classes are smaller. What I have in mind is that the chance of disrupting the class, if you think of it in that way, in, in Lazier's model, uh, itself changes depending upon the student's assignment. At the early grades, especially a child from a disadvantaged background, has no idea what the function of school is or how to behave in the classroom. And that's one of the things the student is learning. Students learn that at most once. So you think you would get a bigger benefit the first year students are in a smaller class. Um, so I had in mind that uh, the socialization or, or the uh, way the student behaves in class and how disruptive they are would evolve depending upon what their experience had been to that point. Um, and if that's the case, then I think you could have a bigger bang for the dollar in terms of class size at the lower grades uh, than at the, at the older grades. Good evening. I am an English teacher here in Trento, and uh, I just want to tell you something not about economic an economical level because I'm not, it's not my field, so I'm not. Uh, but anyway, um, um, a couple of days ago, I talked on the phone with a friend of mine who is a retired headmaster in Dublin, and he said he quoted me um, an, an interesting uh, proverb in English, which says, uh, "Praise youth." and it will flourish. We were talking about some good bad marks that my daughter's had in mathematics. And he said, praise youth and it will flourish. What I think is really this, that um, we have to, we as teachers, I am a teacher, we have to try to find the best relationship among us and our students in order to attain the same goal. So we have to treat them as partners in towards something which uh, will make them shine as a person, worthy person in life. That's all. I don't know if this is quite on point, but I want to mention something we have in the US called KIPP, KIPP Academies, K-I-P-P, -P, which in some sense do try to make partners of the students and their families. And the, the, the students, uh, KIPP schools, I think now brings this right to charter schools, which is part of college and college. So they're publicly supported schools, but they can deviate from many of the regulations. They tend to meet longer, uh, they assign more homework to students stay in the schools longer. Italy has kind of long school hours, but the family sign a contract that they're gonna oversee the student's homework, they're gonna make sure the student attends. Um, and then those types of schools do seem to be generating very positive results. And I, and I think that's associated with what I said earlier about time on task. <laughs> I don't think of that as investment. But I think if you think of it as partnering and making sure that the student and their family are delivering on their side of the bargain, I would agree.
direi che facciamo l'ultima, c'è ancora un'altra, per le ultime due domande e poi... to help African Americans. Um, in my own experience with African American students, and I know some of the uh, data I've seen, um, the women do a lot better, even though they come from the same background. And I'm wondering uh, whether you take culture into account, because we know historically, African American women have been much more conscientious, and they've played a much more effective role. And could that also play a role in, and let's say, the fact that the males drop out, whereas the, the females don't? Um, have you paid attention to that? Uh, uh, yes, and you're, you're certainly right. If you look at rates of college enrollment or high school dropout, um, African American women are much more successful than African American males. And. Uh, and I also, and, and, I, and I think that, you know, can you trace this through, where in most families, the male earns more than the female, and that generates lots of other social problems down the, down the road in terms of the formation of African American families. Um, one of the nice things about having an experiment like I had is that culture is held constant. In Tennessee, about 40% of the students were African Americans. It was a large group of the 11,600. And because children from the same school coming from the same background were randomly assigned, that does hold that aspect of culture constant. And I found it encouraging that the strongest results were for the African American males, at least in terms of the test scores. Um, and the results for crime tended to be uh, affected, you know, were, were, were due to the African American males. Um, so I think it's awfully hard to change culture. And I, and I this is one area where I'm quite laissez faire, and I don't think of kind of restructuring households about how to improve outcomes. So I think here we have an accepted intervention which seems to help the group that has the most difficulties in school, which is a contrast, incidentally, to preschool. So I didn't talk today about preschool education because Italy has very strong preschool education. There's been a lot of research in the United States recently on preschool education, or actually the research isn't so new, but the, the kind of enthusiasm for it is, is somewhat new. And uh, preschool education for disadvantaged children seems to have a very high return, but that's particularly true for women, particularly true for the African American women. The African American male students don't seem to benefit nearly as much from preschool, uh, which is a puzzle why preschool is not helping them. Um, and I think it's important to bear that in mind as we kind of, and I suspect we will move more in the direction of investing more in preschool. I don't think that's going to solve uh, the serious problems we have with that African American. Um, io sono una studentessa, um, I'm a student, uh, and so um, I'm on the other side, um, quindi sono dall'altra parte e um, vorrei, vorrei dire... Um, in parte la, la difficoltà nella relazione fra studenti e i professori è quella che molte volte i professori ehm, non, si, non sfruttano quelli che noi chiamiamo talenti o talents eh, dalla parola proprio latina, talento, è, è la moneta e quindi è la moneta che potrebbe servire maggiormente agli studenti per, per costruire il proprio futuro un capitale che loro hanno per costruire il proprio futuro e, e molto spesso è difficile che degli insegnanti eh, insegnino appunto a sviluppare questo capitale eh, talenti non solo dal punto di vista economico, ma quindi una relazione fra futuro e le proprie capacità personali. Well, uh, let, let me, since you got an applause, I would say I agree with you. Uh, one thing that strikes me in school is we don't tend to value students' time. And I said earlier that reducing class size or the number of teachers per student is the most costly input, but in truth, the most costly input is the opportunity cost of the student's time. And we don't treat students as if they had a meter going, and, and uh, we don't worry about wasting their time. Uh, so I think that's a problem, kind of a universal problem in education. Uh, I do think one way of developing students' talents, as I mentioned earlier, is more contextual learning. 
teaching in the context of what interests them, what they, they might be doing in practice later on. Uh, I would also say in terms of developing talent in Italy, I was struck to see how few foreign students attend higher education in Italy. Uh, Italy is one of the lowest in terms of the OECD in terms of attracting students from abroad to college and graduate school. And I suspect that that's more um, uh, supply than demand. Um, in, in the U.S., especially in graduate school, a very high proportion of our students are from abroad. They, I think, energize our higher education. They um, bring a different perspective, which I think is positive. Uh, and I suspect in Italy, in part because of the lack of flexibility in higher education, the lack of competition among the top research universities, uh, attending graduate school in Italy is less attractive, which I think is unfortunate because I think Italy has many natural advantages, which would make it a mecca as far as college campus goes. Um, so uh, that's another area where I think Italy could probably do a better job of developing talent. Uh, Io sono un'insegnante della scuola primaria e devo dire quella fetta forse l'unica con la scuola eh, dell'infanzia che eh, cerca un rapporto con il bambino, il ragazzo e che cerca di far nascere un attimino questo eh, amore per la cultura, per il sapere che poi verrà sviluppato più avanti forse. E fino adesso è vero, eh, si, sono, si sono avuti dei progressi perché ci hanno dato, abbiamo avuto la possibilità di avere laboratori, laboratori creativi, ma laboratori anche in campo eh, delle scienze, della matematica, e questo vuol dire soldi, investire. Eh, da quest'anno, eh, per l'anno prossimo, anno 2007-2008, nella scuola elementare, non sappiamo come pagare gli studi i supplenti, quelli che ci, se noi ci amaliamo, forse eh, c'è bisogno di eh, una, qualcuno che prosegua o perlomeno consolidi un pochino la nostra attività. Eh, non abbiamo, ci hanno dato, ci davano pro, per, a bambino eh, 5,70 euro e eh, dall'anno prossimo avremo 0,99 questo è un piccolo. Questi bellissimi, ehm, anche le, i comuni e la provincia eh, ha rispetto eh, le nostre, eh, ciò che eh, ci dava le nostre eh, possibilità. Questi bellissimi eh, studi, queste bellissime conclusioni, i nostri politici arrivano, giovano, ci risollevano noi, però chi lavora direttamente è un po'... Well, I, I can't give a complete answer to your question about how uh, research on education translates into uh, public policy in Italy, uh, but I can tell you that I think having a festival like this one is one way uh, for the uh, public learn more about the research findings and uh, through the public's own education uh, to try to influence public policy. Uh, and I have to say I'm very impressed by the interest uh, that's been displayed uh, at this session and throughout, throughout this festival. Uh, and hopefully uh, the politicians will eventually see uh, and have translated to them uh, the research findings so they, they can put them in practice. Thank you. Hello. Le domande e le risposte alle domande, naturalmente, e ci auguriamo di averlo ospite ancora qui al Festival dell'Economia. Buonasera a tutti.